All right. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome. On behalf of Harvard University's Microbial Science Initiative, or MSI, thanks for tuning in. Today, we'll have a talk in our virtual summer seminar series called The Many Facets of Microbiology. Uh, actually, The Many Facets of Microbial Science where we aim to hear about a variety of different microbiology topics from the researchers who make it happen. As we at MSI have adapted our programming this year in response to COVID-19, there have been a few silver linings of going virtual for events like symposia and these seminars. Uh, one is that I'm now getting to realize my latent dream of being a radio or talk show host, so hi mom. Uh, and then two is that we've been able to expand our events beyond the Cambridge Boston area. Uh, now including audience members and guests from more far-flung geographic locations. And that's really illustrated today because our guest speaker is broadcasting all the way from Australia. And to accommodate the 14 hour time difference is Gamely giving her talk at 6 a.m. Queensland time. So we're really extra grateful for that. In just a moment, you'll be hearing from Dr. Serena Love. According to a radio interview I heard, Dr. Love's fascination with ancient cultures was cemented early in life on a family trip to see historic pyramids in modern day Mexico. Dr. Love went on to study anthropology and archeology, span earning a PhD in anthropology from Stanford University in 2011. Her extensive teaching efforts have been recognized by numerous awards and in the field, she's contributed to more than a dozen excavations and survey projects in Egypt, Israel, Turkey, and Iraq. With expertise in soils, many of her publications focus on ancient building materials. And recently, her research interests have expanded to include foods and beverages of antiquity. In 2018, she collaborated with an Australian brewery to produce three ancient Egypt-inspired beers for the Queensland Museum's Egyptian Mummies exhibition. A self-described recovering academic, beer enthusiast, and gastro-Egyptologist, Dr. Love now works as a heritage consultant at the Everett Foundation in Australia and is leading the archeological arm of an interdisciplinary effort to recreate ancient sourdough, which is the project we'll be hearing about today. So as far as scheduling goes, we'll hear from Dr. Love for the next 20 to 25 minutes. Then we'll have a Q&A session in which we'll also be joined in discussion by a Harvard yeast biologist. I invite and encourage anyone who's watching to submit question using questions using the YouTube chat features and you really don't have to wait until the Q&A portion to submit those. You can submit them as you think of them and we'll try to address as many as we can during that Q&A portion. All right, so without any further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Lowe. Hi, good afternoon or good, good morning to those of us in Australia. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, even virtually. So this is really fantastic. Um, and thanks for tuning in, being interested in this project. Um, I do have uh, a couple of slides that I'm going to share. So I'm going to turn over to my screen share and screen share this. And put these slides up. There we go. So um, the title of the talk is uh, Ancient Yeast, the Ancient Yeast Project from Tomb to Table. Um, and just wanted to kind of explain a little bit about the project and uh, from an archaeological perspective, knowing that I am not the, the microbiologist um, part of this team, um, but uh, I'll give you a bit of a, of a brief explanation of the project and how we got to where we are. And, the projected um, outcome. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how this project came about and um, some of the research, the research objectives, uh, also some of the preliminary results and the expected outcomes and some of the future directions. And I'll talk a little bit about the beer. But I do wanna give a few disclaimers. First of all, that I am a part of a team. So there are three of us. The other two are Seamus Blackley, who was instigated the project and is really the driving force behind it. And he was the one who was also doing all the sample collections. And the other one is Rich Bowman, who is the microbiologist. And, and they are the ones who kind of devised the methodology um, and working together with Seamus and I to put the, the science part of this together. All the images that I'll be showing in this presentation are all from Seamus Blackley's Twitter account. Um, and I also want to make the note that this is a privately funded project that the three of us all have other day jobs. Um, this is a side project for all three of us. Uh, Rich is 
PhD project is on a different topic. Seamus is a CEO of his own company, and I work as a heritage consultant in Australia. So all three of us have very different jobs. This is something on the side that we're all three of us quite passionate about, very interested in, um, but this isn't uh, strictly what we do, and we don't have external funding yet. Uh, we will get there. <laughs> Um, so where this project started was with a single tweet. So uh, Seamus, uh, back in April 2019, um, put out this tweet that he had some ancient Egyptian yeast that he sourced from scrapings of an Egyptian um, uh, ancient Egyptian bread pot. And that was quite curious. Uh, I got brought into the conversation by a friend of mine who knew that I was interested in beer and uh, coming off the back of the Queensland Museum's project of, of the three beers that we did for their exhibition, my friend said, hey, maybe you would be interested in this and uh, we could do something with this yeast and, and make some, you know, remake those beers with actual ancient Egyptian yeast. So I looked at it and, and had, you know, had a few questions like this. What, what time period were these pots coming from? Um, where did the, you know, what context did the pots come from? Were they from a bakery? Were they from a tomb? Were they symbolic? Were they actually used? Um, what, and what else do we know about the pots? And then also how was the, the, the yeast extracted? How do we know that it wasn't just from the surface? Do we actually have uh, ancient Egyptian yeast or do we just have museum dust knowing that this object probably came from a museum somewhere in the United States originally, um, or at least in the last, 100 to 100 years. And so I, I just had all these questions. And so I put them back to Seamus and said, you know, what could we, could we answer any of these? And, and he didn't want it. He redacted the source, which is fine to protect the identity of where it came from, which is which I respect. But I, I had, I still couldn't answer my questions. And so this is where the, the project was born because we thought, well, let's do it again properly. Like if, if these questions are valid and, and, and let's explore it further. And so my job in this in this was to get get us access to to museums, and to to start the project uh, anew. And what I didn't know is at the same time, Rich Bowman was asking him the same kind of questions on the microbiology side of things, and uh, and so they were kind of developing something at the same time. So that's how the three of us kind of came together. Um, and as soon as I got access to the museums, and Seamus was able to go. Um, and actually use Rich's uh, methodology to extract to extract the yeast. So one of the other kind of disclaimers that I want to say is that the, this work got a lot of media attention and the media got ahead of the science and the science is still ongoing and the results are, we don't have the results yet. So as much as I'd love to say that we actually have ancient Egyptian yeast, the fact is we don't know just yet. So that's the disclaimer. The other disclaimer that I want to mention is that it the science is still on ongoing. So here are the questions that that this project devised. Um, is I want to know. We want to know what the, is the regional diversity uh, of yeast within ancient Egypt. So Egypt is a is is pretty much linear. It's all up and down the Nile from the Delta all the way down to Aswan. And that's about 800 kilometers. So there's gonna be a lot of different environmental conditions within the country. So the, the Delta is, um, it's got a lot of water. It's got a lot of different plants. It's going to have a different kind of in environment. Whereas the further south you go in Upper Egypt, it's drier. It's much more desert. So I'm expecting that there will be different kinds of yeasts uh, throughout the country. So part of the objective is to get yeast strains, get pots, get vessels from different parts of the country, and then also to recognize the temporal diversity. So the other aspect is to question from uh, from the big, from the beginning, from the pre-dynastic to the to the end, from the last Egypt, uh, true Egyptian king, Nectanebo II, uh, in about 300 BC. So, what's the temporal shift? Uh, in, is there genetic drift within this time period? Um, and how much, you know, how many different kinds of yeast species do we have? Uh, and I understand that this is very difficult to prove in a modern sense, uh, and it might be an impo impossible task to prove in an ancient sense, but this is, these are some of the objectives. Can we try, can we, you know, try it? Can we do it? Uh, and what would the potential results be? And then the other questions would be about yeast specialization. Um, bread and beer would have been produced in the same facilities, at least initially. 
Um, so will there be different yeast species um, or different varieties? And then as those two became specialist products, was there a divergent in the yeast species? So that, again, some other questions that we're, we're looking at. Um, so my job, like I said, was to gain access to the museums, which was actually easier said than done. The most obvious place to collect ancient Egyptian yeast would actually be in Egypt itself, but Egypt has very strict export rules uh, and prohibits, um, you know, researchers just coming in and, and um, removing um, uh, samples from the country. So, um, especially when it comes to archaeological sites. So we targeted museum collections. So I drew on my professional network of archaeology and museum colleagues and institutions that I knew that had ancient Egyptian collections. Some of the curators I contacted had ignored my inquiries, but luckily others were intrigued enough to ask questions and allowed us to explain our methodology and eventually granted us access into their collections. So the strat my sampling strategy was to to target vessels that would have actually been used. So a lot of the objects that you get in ancient Egyptian tombs would be symbolic. So they would create objects to go inside of a tomb that may not have been used in real life. So the purpose of putting these objects into a tomb was so that they would function magically in the afterlife. And so sometimes the objects would have been used and but sometimes not. And so I was looking for collections where I knew I was, I was trying to prefer um, objects from settlement sites or things that are like from an actual bakery, something that would have been used, which means it would have actually held beer in it or have been baked um, or, you know, held, held dough in it. So I was looking for bread molds, beer jugs, <clears throat> and also loaves of bread. And I was trying to focus on settlement sites rather than, than tombs. So we, the collection that we have so far, we gained access to the, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, also the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography um, or Ethnology at Harvard, and the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. I also have permission to get access to the, the Yale Peabody Museum. They have two little bread molds that are um, uh, that would have held uh, bread at some point. And I also have permission to go to the Egyptian Museum in Turin in Northern Italy. And I have two applications pending at the Petrie Museum in London, which has an extensive settlement collection that I'm quite eager to, to sample from and also the Queensland Museum here in Brisbane. Um, uh, of these, we've collected several samples. Uh, well more than 12, I believe. The only ones that may have been problematic are the ones from the Phoebe Hearst Museum because unbeknownst to me, this was a bit of a learning curve questions that I needed to ask before sending Seamus to, to Berkeley to go and sample it is that the objects were actually given a bath in the 1970s uh, to remove salts. Um, so I'm not sure what that may have done to, to the yeast that was perhaps trapped inside the, the ceramic matrix, but, but we'll see. So the, the next part was the methodology. And I know that this is probably the, the bit that most everyone here is interested in, but is uh, less in the realm of my, uh, of my expertise. This is, this is where Rich, uh, Rich Bowman and Seamus were collaborating. Um, so he devised, they, they both devised um, a methodology to, to reactivate the yeast and to extract it from the pots. So this, um, I, I will mention this briefly because this is uh, actually, Rich sent me a fantastic email to ex explain a little bit of this. So of um, the liquid media that was being used uh, is uh, to extract the yeast is a, is a peptone with dextrose um, added with added amino acids. And uh, one was just that, and then the other one was inoculated with tetracycline. And the methodology was, you know, in a very, as much of a sterile environment as we could um, to uh, cleanse the surface and also just to make sure that we were avoiding any contaminants. Um, from what I, uh, from what I understand is that the, the first uh, cotton ball was put on uh, the surface of the, of the object um, and put um, a kind of injected through the cotton ball into the, the ceramic matrix. It was left there for a couple of minutes and then removed. And then the second one 
um, was uh, with the inoculated media and actually put into the ceramic matrix um, and removed again and then put into sterilized vials. Um, and then it was sent off to, to Rich's lab at the University of Iowa. So that's as, as much as I understand um, of, the, of the methodology. Uh, and then the, the, the magic that Rich did in his lab is something that I'm gonna have to leave to him to, to explain. I know that he is here live. So if anyone has those kinds of questions, you could put them in and, um, and hopefully Rich can answer them much better than I can. Um, but what we did have is we were able to to extract yeast. So the two vessels that proved to be the most successful are from the, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And one is from the bread loaf and the other is from the beer jar. And it took some time for Rich to separate out the yeast from the bacteria, but we, he has been able to isolate the, the yeast strains, uh, one from the bread and one from the yeast. So the, the samples that we have are from the, the the beer jug is from Giza, it's from one of the fourth dynasty tombs. So you're looking at a time period of about 2500 BC. And this, that's that image there on the left. And the other one is a Middle Kingdom bread loaf from Della Bahri, which is down in Thebes. And this, this is an interesting um, object. It's actually a loaf of bread. It's a, tri a triangular loaf of bread that was found in a foundation deposit. So it, it was, it was made, it was put into a hole at the base of a, of a temple when the temple was first founded uh, in, the, in the New Kingdom, sorry, in the Middle Kingdom. So this is about two, 2000 to 1998 um, BCE. And this is the temple of uh, Mentu Hotep Nebhebet Ray II. Um, and it's famously in the same location as Hatshepsut's temple. Uh, it's the one that's uh, to, the left, to the left of it and is, um, uh, hasn't been restored the way the Hatshepsut's temple is, but um, is there and is a bit earlier. So the samples that we have are um, uh, two different regional locations. We've got one from the at the the apex of the delta, and then we have one down from Thebes, and then we have the temporal diversity that I'm looking I'm looking for. So these are the two that we're playing with, and these are the two that we will be sending off for DNA and RNA analysis. So unbeknownst to me, um, Seamus squirreled away a piece of uh, one of the samples from the bread loaf. So the Middle Kingdom bread loaf, he took a piece home uh, or uh, took a vial of it home and started cu cultivating it and um, for, for sourdough baking. And this, this is the tweet from August last year that really started to get us noticed um, by the media. And this is the one that has really kind of um, has taken off. So what he did with it was just took it home and in a sterile environment as possible, he's got an autoclave in the kitchen and he's sterilizing the yeast. Sorry, he's not sterilizing the yeast. He's sterilizing the flour. He's sterilizing the utensils. He's sterilizing everything that he can um, and uh, feeding, the, uh, feeding the yeast to, into a sourdough culture and the, to, to which he was able to make bread. Um, and so this was the emmer loaf that he made back in August uh, and has successfully been making bread with it uh, ever, ever since. Um, so some of the questions about how do we know that it's an ancient variety? So one of the, the kind of preliminary results, and this is circumspect, I understand, but um, one of the, the lines of evidence that we think we actually have in ancient yeast is the fact that it feeds off of emmer and only emmer. So emmer is the, is the wheat variety that was present in, in ancient Egypt. And when the yeast culture that he took from the museum was fed white flour, nothing really happened. And then he fled it to, what, to whole wheat flour. And again, not much happened. And then spelt flour. And then finally, when it got to emmer flour, it really took off. So that's one of the things we thought was really interesting. And I experimented with the same thing when I uh, last saw uh, Seamus in, in Los Angeles, I was able to come home with a, a sample of the yeast and I did the exact same experiment and it didn't react to white and it didn't react to wholemeal and it didn't react to spelt, but it definitely reacted to emmer. And from emmer, I was able to, to make my own sourdough loaves, not nearly as beautiful as Seamus's, but I do what I can as an amateur baker. 
Um, so that's really quite interesting. And then the other uh, line of evidence is the beer. So Rich Bowman, again, is also an amateur beer maker, uh, and he made a batch of wort, and then he split the batch and added the different yeast varieties to it. So he added um, uh, the bread yeast to one batch and the beer to uh, the beer yeast to the other batch um, and created two very distinct flavored beers. So again, this we know that um, yeast will contribute fairly significantly to the, the, the nose and the characteristics and the profile of a beer. So to me, this suggests that we do actually indeed have two different yeast varieties. Again, it's an unproven conclusion, but it is quite interesting as, as, as a possibility that we might actually have something here. Um, so some of the other things that we're, we're venturing into, and this is where a lot of my interest lies in the experimental archaeology, we're learning a lot about, um, about how bread was baked in, in ancient Egypt. So this is a, a tomb scene from a, a fifth dynasty tomb of tea from, Saqqara, um, from Saqqara. And it's about 100% of what we know about what bread was, how bread was made in ancient Egypt from the artistic record. We have uh, bakeries that were found at Giza that are um, a couple, uh, about 100 years earlier than this image. But this is kind of the, the process of how, how we know about baking and and you know, we can see the image in the in the top in the top right where the men are, are pounding the, the grain and you can see them they're winnowing it and they're grinding it and they're sieving it um, and then on the bottom registers you see a woman um, with her hand in, in front of her face and she's sitting in front of a, a stack of pots and then you can see on the bottom where you've got the pots on the bottom and then there's a guy kind of pouring dough into the pots and then putting a second heated pot on top. And there's a couple of these that we're recreating right now. So this is the, the next step of this project is, is to, to recreate this process and see how much more we can learn from it. So you can see the, the picture of the man holding the pot that's from Giza. And those are the size of the bread loaves so the ancient Egyptian pyramid workers were actually fed on a diet of, of bread, beer, and, and onions. That was their daily allowance. So, so bread and beer is actually what fueled pyramid construction. Um, and uh, it, it actually fed everybody from every, every class. So it's, it's the engine behind uh, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian society. So we just very curious to see, to see how this is, is gonna go. So we're uh, working right now with some potters in Los Angeles to recreate these kinds of pots um, and see how we can bake in, in um, uh, bake in heated pots. So these are some of the experiments that Seamus has been doing in his backyard. These are just tagine pots, um, just clay pots that he's been success, quite successfully baking in. And so just taking the heated pot, putting in the dough and heating coals and putting uh, it into the ground. And so we're starting to scale this up uh, with the experimental outdoor baking. Uh, and um, many, many more questions are coming out of this of this experimental research. And um, I, I just wish I could fly back to LA right now uh, and, be a, and be a part of this. But um, like this lecture, everything we're doing right now is all virtual. Um, so some of the, the future directions of the, of the project is that when the labs reopen, we can finish with the DNA and the RNA sampling. Uh, sorry, the analysis, and then there's there's more samples. Like I said, we've still got permission to visit some more um, museums, um, and I, it's just to diversify our data set. So again, I want to get things from an earlier time period and a later time period, and uh, from different parts of the country. Um, also, the ongoing experimental archaeology. So baking, we're doing the Old Kingdom. Um, bakery replica, and also to start experimenting more with beer, with uh, with uh, using this yeast for for beer. But something also that's quite passionate to all three of us is actually to return the yeast culture to Egypt. So once we know that we can confirm that we have an ancient variety, it would be 
you know, these are from museum collections that were collected at the you know, turn of the century or the early 1900s, is actually to return the, the East culture to Egypt. It's, it's not ours. Uh, and before we can ever do anything else with it um, is to seek permission to, to use it. So I do want to acknowledge my, my collaborators on this, Seamus Blackley and Rich Bowman. Also give acknowledgement to the museums who gave us access and to also the institutional support of uh, the University of Iowa, University of Queensland and the Everett Foundation where I sit and also some of the Egypt, my Egyptology colleagues who have been helping me throughout this process. And I'll say thank you and happy to answer any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Serena. All right, so we'll move into a Q&A and discussion portion for which we're also welcoming Dr. Andrew Murray. Uh, Dr. Murray's on faculty at Harvard studying yeast evolutionary biology. So we invited him here to offer some perspective through that lens on some of these questions that you've raised or, or that um, may be received from the audience. Um, just think about, to think about it from numerous different angles. Um, that said, I, I really love hearing your perspective, Serena, because certainly going to these, handling these museum samples or being at these sites is something that most of us haven't and won't have the chance to do. So it's, a, it's wonderful to hear about that perspective. Um, so I think that you two may have some questions for each other, but I'm curious to, I'll just kick off this discussion in Q&A with one that I had thought of. I'm curious, Serena, whether there is much continuity from the baking methods that you mentioned, the, the panel that you showed and, and our understanding of baking methods in ancient Egypt, whether there was any continuity of those methods until later or even modern day Egypt, and also whether emmer is still used as a, as a common flower in any areas of the world. Uh, the Old Kingdom method of baking in bread pots seemed to disappear by mm -hmm. the by the Middle Kingdom. So it seems that about um, 2000 BC it was abandoned and actually moved to ovens, which is the the method that's being used, still used today. The um, shams, uh, the I'm shams, the the sun sun bread as it's called, or, or the uh, Aish baladi, just the the bread of of the villagers. Um, so that method of baking in the pots dis uh, yeah, was disused. Um, and as far as emmer, I don't, I know that emmer is still grown. I know we can buy emmer, I can buy it in Australia, I can, we can buy it in the US, but I don't think that it's particularly popular. And I don't know about the, the rest of the world where, where emmer, it, it's, it's obviously still being grown, but it, it doesn't seem to be that that well it's quite dense uh and it, it doesn't you know get the the fluffy um uh you know the the fluffy texture and it doesn't have as much gluten in it so it it um yeah it's just not favored for bread but i can't speak for the rest of the world mm. sorry yeah no that's great thank you so welcome thanks for joining us dr murray too uh, I know that, like I say, I know you all had maybe shared some some questions with each other pre-discussion. I'm happy to open it up for that, and I'll also check for questions that are coming in from YouTube and pop in with those periodically, but but you're welcome to take it away. So I guess I'm interested to know in how Seamus Blackley got all excited about this to start with. Well, <laughs> that's really for him to... To, to say more than me, but from my understanding is he's an amateur baker, he's a hobby baker, um, and has been experimenting with sourdoughs for, for quite a while. And um, yeah, he came upon this this ancient, um, this supposedly ancient Egyptian yeast culture. And I think he had a, another friend who had a, a Roman samples and um, I, I can't remember exactly the whole story on that one. And he had been collecting wild sourdough starters from, you know, behind his house and um, on, you know, in the hills behind where he lives. And also, I think on a trip to the UK, he did a, a wild um, yeast starter. So he's he's been interested in this for a while. I mean, in, by training, he's a particle physicist and, and he's had a very diverse career. So this is just a, a hobby for him, as I understand it. What questions do you have for me? I, I, I don't, 
know yeast that well and and i i'm in this for the for the egyptian side but am, am i barking up the wrong tree and thinking that we're that there's going to be these regional differences and temporal differences and is there going to be a difference between bread and beer yeast so I, the answer to that is that people have isolated and sequenced our friend the bakers and brewers yeast saccharomyces cerevisiae from all sorts of different places and they see genetic diversity so that the yeast that you isolate from sake and from trees in Malaysia and from vineyards in France and from North American um, sap on oak trees is all different from each other and you so you see and you see lots of species like this species that are used to make wine are hybrids of a whole series of different lineages. And so you can see genetic differences and those genetic differences, some of them have to do with where yeast are isolated from. And some of them have to do with how it's been selected for things like brewing and whether it's sake or, or beer by humans. And I think the, com the complicated thing is we don't have any really very good knowledge of temporal evolution outside the laboratory because when we find yeast, well, so there hasn't been that much isolation. The isolating yeast from nature is a relatively recent thing. And also um, we have no idea how long individual yeast cells would survive in the wild. And the suspicion is that the answer is is not very long, as in not very long, as in not many, not many, if any, centuries. Okay. And so the, the the complicated question is, how would you would convince yourself if you isolate yeast from a museum specimen that it's yeast that's been there since the people who used it before it became an archeological artifact as opposed to sort of seeping in in rainwater or coming off the fingers of the people who collected it. And since we arranged to have this discussion, I've been thinking about how you would try and demonstrate that. And it's hard to do. And the, the thing that's really hard is what you want is you want a graduate student to live, you want to send a graduate student 5,000 years backwards in time and tell them to deposit yeast on some pot. And you want that yeast to have some unique DNA sequence that you will be able to find later. And so I tried calling the BBC to see if they would lease Doctor Who and the TARDIS to me so we could send off and do the experiment. And the trouble is, you know, so you can, you can ask a question like, if you took a population of yeast and you allowed them to make spores and then you put them on a pot and you put them in the conditions where you find these things, right? And then you could go back after a year or five, five years, 10 years, maybe even 20 years. And you ask, okay, what fraction of the spores are alive? Now, if that follows some sort of mathematical distribution, like let's say the fraction that are alive falls off exponentially, then you can make a prediction which it, that if you left something there for 4,000 years, it would be this fraction. And then that fraction is either so small that you think it's very unlikely you can recover them, or maybe it's big. But we, we haven't even done that simple experiment. And even if you do the experiment, then you'd have to trust the extrapolation. So it's, a, it's a, I mean, I think what you'll find is you'll find diversity in yeast, and it will be exciting. And you'll find it makes different sorts of beers and different sorts of bread. But you'll, at least as far as my feeble mind can think about it, I don't know of a way that you can demonstrate that that's the yeast that the ancient Egyptians used. That relates to, to a question that I have, Serena. And just I was hoping you could paint a picture for us of uh, what it, what the methods are when something like one of the artifacts that you've used is being is being excavated. My knowledge is pretty much limited to some National Geographic specials, and and I'm imagining that there are gloves worn, you know, for sort of physical protection. But to what extent can can we imagine? I don't, I don't think it's sterile. That is that is what I'm imagining. And like, to what extent would you want to add steps to that process if you were trying to? 
do something in a way to make sure you were preserving the microbial community. Yeah, so I, I would say that when these objects were excavated in the, the 20s or the turn of the century, sterilization was not one of the considerations. <laughs> um, uh, and also these, like, for example, the, the bread loaf was actually found in the ground. So the yeast that we have in that loaf of bread, as I understand, yeast doesn't survive the baking process. So the, the yeast spores that would be in that loaf of bread are most likely to be from the earth that it was recovered in. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, you know, the, the process of it coming from, you know, from its original context of where it was excavated to wherever it was stored and then how it traveled to Boston and then had the conditions in which it's been in a museum storeroom for what, 22 years mm -hmm. since it was originally excavated. So there's this whole train of contaminants that could have been introduced at any stage. But what I understand is that the methods that we're deriving are actually extracting yeast from the interior of the, of mm. the bread. So the interior of the matrix. So what we're hoping is that all these contaminants, and, and please correct me if I don't have this right, but my understanding is that these contaminants that would have been introduced either by people or by touching or by dust would all be surface mm -hmm. and not actually embedded into the matrix of the, of the vessel or into the matrix of the bread. And so the, the methods, when the reasons that we're injecting this solution this inoculated solution with tetracycline into the matrix of, of, the, of the bread and of the vessel is to extract the, the yeast that's inside the bread or inside the vessel and not actually on the surface. Mm -hmm. So that's how I understood that we were bypassing the issue of contaminants. Okay. So we got a question from the audience. I'll, I'll share two here. One is Emmer the same as Pharaoh? No. No, they're different grains. Yeah, they are grains. They're different grains, yeah. Okay. And then a follow-up, where did the emmer that was fed to these ancient yeasts come from? Did you feed emmer from different places, parts of the world where it could be sourced? And if yes, were there any differences? Um, well, the only difference is that the 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 emmer that Seamus is, is getting is from the United States. I believe it's being grown in like Bakersfield, California. And the emmer that I'm getting is being grown and raised in Australia, um, but we haven't been able to compare our samples um, given current conditions. Um, I'd be really quite curious to see how we've got the same kind of grain and ideally the same yeast strain uh, in two different places on two different you know, supposed flowers, uh, both of emmer strains and see how different our yeast cultures would be. I mean, if we could do yet another DNA analysis on that would be fascinating. Um, but I, 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 I don't know. Okay, yeah, no, that's great. And then, uh, let's see, someone else asks, uh, I work with killer yeasts, i.e. yeast that, ex that inhibit other yeasts. Would it be possible to analyze these yeasts that you have for the presence of that phenotype? Uh, I have to bat that one back to Dr. Murray, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. So, so killer yeast, there are yeast that carry plasmids, pieces of RNA, not DNA, that enable them to make toxins to which they themselves are immune. And then they can kill yeast who don't have the plasmids and that's why they're called killer yeast yeah. and so the interesting question is what's the evolutionary history of these little plasmids that yeast pass around and if we're isolating yeast from thousands of years ago do they have these same things and yes you could in principle ask if the yeast that you guys have isolated will kill other yeast strains. Nice. Um, so someone else from the audience asks, are archaeological museum collections ever monitored for microbial contamination? Oh, fascinating. I have no idea. Um, 
if there's a curator out in the audience or anyone from museum studies, that would be an awesome question. Um, I know they're not sterile environments. The 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 time that I spent as a, as an undergraduate intern in the Hearst Museum at Berkeley, um, they're definitely not sterile environments unless it needs to be. You know, unless it's you know something that's organic. Um, then you know it'll be protected and temperature controlled and all and, and all that. But as far as the pottery collection, um, I can only speak from a very limited experience in museums. Is they you know they're in um, cupboards basically um, that are not sealed or anything like that. So I would incline to say no, they're not controlled at all for microbial contamination. But um, um, yeah, yeah. I'm sure if it was organic, it definitely would be, but not for the inorganic stuff like the ceramics. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a simple test you can do. Okay. You can take this, which is your hand, and you can take any sort of microbiological agar plate, and you can just rub your fingers on it, and then you can put it in an incubator, and you can come back 48 hours later, and you will discover there is a veritable microbial zoo on it so when my kids were younger in the winter in particular we would go to the peabody museum which my children referred to as the dead animal museum <laughs> and my lab was across the street and so we once went to the lab and and we did an experiment with phoebe and bennett so we took some plates and we got them to rub their fingers grubby little fingers across them and then we washed their hands with soap and water to test how important it was to wash their hands with soap and water. And we rubbed their now less grubby fingers across the plate. And then to see if we could actually kill anything that was on their hands, we um, took a paper towel and wet it with 70% ethanol and had them rub their hands thoroughly and rub them across the plate. And two days later, I went back. So it is really true that ethanol kills microbes. So there was nothing on those plates. The grubby fingers plates were covered with just this amazing collection of molds and bacteria <laughs> and the ones that were washed with soap and water were exactly the same as the grubby ones so oh. i later talked to someone who's a I guess medical anthropologist and they were waxing lyrical about how important hand washing was and i described this experiment and they said Oh, that's okay, because the things that are pathogens to human, bacteria that kill humans, all of those are destroyed by soap and the water if it's really, really hot. And I was like, man, that's just such a bunch of hooey. And so it's, in, no, it's really interesting because, you know, one of the COVID precautions is you've got to wash your hands wash your for 20 hands. seconds. And so my guess is COVID's an envelope virus and the detergent really does a number on it. But for many, many bacterial and fungal spores. And so that's just, I mean, in a sense, that's a, an answer to the question of how sterile is anything in a museum, as long as curators and the people who exhibited things, exactly like Serena said, have handled it on the way. They sort of have a history of all the microbes of everyone who's ever touched it, right? Mm -hmm. And they often, you know, if there's if there are no organic things on the vessels, they won't grow, but they're there. And then Richard Bowman can extract them. Mm -hmm. Well, related <laughs> so. to the the question, Dr. Murray, of whether of figuring out once one sequences a yeast, whether it's ancient or what, or how closely related it is to other yeasts. How extensive are our phylogenies that exist for bakers and brewers yeast? Have a lot of yeast been sequenced or is that not so many? And, and I guess I'm wondering how easy or difficult it will be to compare the sequences that Serena's team gets from to, to sequences that already exist and place them in, in some sort of relationship. Yeah, can we drop the doctor and just call me Andrew, please? Like, sure, sorry. Be, <laughs> I mean, Serena's doctor loves to... Um, no. <laughs> so, um, so the answer to your question is because there are lots of per people who work on yeast, it's one of the sort of model organisms in molecular biology, 
and because there's been this sort of growth industry in roughly the last 20 years of, of studying people collecting yeast outside the lab, there have been tons and tons of genome sequences, not only of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but a very closely related species, like the most closely related species called Saccharomyces paradoxus and there's Saccharomyces bionis and all sorts of things. So there's tons and tons of, of information about that. There has also been projects to sequence thousands of um, fungal genomes. And so we know a ton. And so when Serena and Rich Bowman and Seamus Blackley, when they get sequenced back, we will be able, or they and, and people who want to help them, will be able to make a very detailed, like, this is who these yeasts are closest to. And, and in particular, whether they're like um, sort of modern industrial brewing and, and baking yeasts, where they're clearly the hybrids of many different lineages. And so um, it will be super exciting to see where they lie. Awesome. Yeah, because that's one of my questions is how do I know when we actually have ancient yeast? What, what does think, it look like? Think, yeah, and I think that, right. And so I guess, so, so what you'll know is you'll know how closely related it is to other stuff and how much it's in a little offshoot of its own. And if it's in a little offshoot of its own, it, it, it could indicate, it can indicate two things. It, could just indicate it's a sort of yeast that people don't sample very frequently because pe the people I know who go and collect yeast, Egypt is not a major destination, right? Because, well, it's not the sort of place you expect to find yeast naturally not associated with humans because it's hot and dry and there's not too much rotting fruit lying on the ground and, and stuff like that. And so it could prove to be very similar to some yeast we already know about. And then it's like, well, it looks like those guys it still doesn't, it doesn't help us know whether the yeast you isolated have been alive for 5,000 or 4,000 years or not. It just tells you it's close to some people, we, some yeast we know, or it could be quite different. And, and then we're still, it's, it's either, it's geographically different because yeast in Egypt look different from yeast elsewhere. And so the thing to do would be Actually, the thing to do would be to run around collecting yeast from places nearby in Egypt that are not archaeological sites, right? And if that yeast looks super similar to the, the yeast that you're isolating from ancient vessels, again, you have, you have two choices. One is, well, sure, because it's, it's, in the same location, but they're 5,000 years apart. And you don't expect that much genetic change in 5,000 years. Or you could interpret it as like, maybe the yeast I find on my vessels got washed onto them or handled onto them later on. And, and so I think it's trying to figure, I guess, you know, when you have animal artifacts or human artifacts, when you have enough mass of stuff, you can do radiocarbon dating and so you can unequivocally figure out that pilt down man was a forgery by some crazy archaeologist. Um, but when you have things that are small in yeast, that's way too small to do radiocarbon dating on. And, and, and you know, the criterion is I don't want the dead thing, I want a living thing. And so as soon as the thing's reproduced in modern times, if you did radiocarbon date it, it would date to yesterday. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think you essentially just addressed a question, that, another question that I had as well, which was curiosity as to whether some of the extensive sour, sourdough sampling that's being done, at least I know within the United States, I was curious if it had extended yet globally or was going on at all in, in Egypt. Do either of you happen to know? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, and I think sourdough is super interesting because in a sort of brief crazed phrase out phase recently, I was thinking of studying sourdough because there are people who report that they've kept sourdough cultures going for a century. And so then the question is, 
if that's really, if you can sort of verify that and you can have access to them, you could start a modern sourdough culture. Now you don't know that the one 100 years ago looked exactly like that, but you could try and ask how much the microorganisms, and it's not just baker's yeast and sourdough, how much they had adapted evolutionarily under the selective pressure of growing in sourdough, trying to beat out their neighbors for 100 years. I think it's a super interesting question. And also just, how different sourdough is in different parts of the world. So there's an analogous um, issue with cheese. So Rachel Dutton was a, a research fellow who worked at Harvard, who's interested in both microbiology and cheese. And so she set out to be the first person to extensively, so the rind of cheese is basically, um, if you're squeamish, cover your ears. Um, it's a mixture of yeast and fungi basically for, for most cheeses. And, um, and so what Rachel did was to sequence the same sort of cheeses in different parts of the world to ask if, and so people make the rinds in different ways. If rinds that were made in similar ways in different parts of the world contain similar microbes. And the answer I think somewhat surprisingly is that they do, right? So what humans are somehow good at doing is selecting for the growth of particular microbes by setting up culture conditions where a small consortium of species grows much better than everyone else. Okay. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> there's some really, there's some really neat, neat work being done on the microbiology of fermented foods in an ongoing, yeah. in an ongoing manner. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions, and then I want to make sure we save a little bit of time to talk about some of the qualities of the, the bread and the beer that you've worked on, but I'll sneak in one or two quick ones here. Um, Dr. Lover, are you receiving any support from the Egyptian government to support such groundbreaking findings? And if not, is it support you would welcome? Uh, we are not receiving any, and yes, I would welcome it. We are looking to um, you know, get access to, uh, I've been having conversations with the Egyptian Ministry um, of Culture and to see if we can go into Egypt and collect um, and also create a relationship for which we can just open a dialogue and, you know, I guess, a re return the yeast well, once we have it verified and, and just create a dialogue. And um, yeah, I would very much like that. Awesome. And then someone asked, and this is a really good segue into, into talking a little bit more about uh, your, the beer you produce as well. Someone asked, what did the bread and beer taste like? And I think they were referencing those that were generated for this project, but then I'd also love mm -hmm. to hear about the, the beers that were produced for the Queensland Mummies exhibit. Yeah, sure. So the bread is, um, it, it's delicious. It's, it's dense. It has a caramel kind of flavor to it. Um, the, the sourdough culture of it, uh, by itself um, has a very distinctive nose to it. So the other sourdough cultures that, that Seamus has, it, the Egyptian one has a distinctive nose to it. And, and as I understand it, you know, many different sourdoughs based on, you know, different yeasts or, you know, different, the way it's fed to different flours um, will all produce a different nose, but this one is quite distinctive. Um, and then the, the emmer flour that's used is, is, is a dense bread or is a dense flour and is also something that, um, is not very uh, common. So I've never eaten a, a loaf of bread made out of emmer before. And so mm -hmm. when I first visited Seamus in, in August last year, um, and he presented me with this loaf, it was, it, it was, it was a tangible thing of the past for me. This is where the gastroegyptology uh, term came in. But it was also, it was, it was emmer, it was the flour, it was the way, you know, that it was baked, and it was just this, this thing. So it was, um, you know, presented on a plate it looked like just a piece of toast, but it most definitely wasn't. And it it was tangy, um, but also the the flour had um, a, a distinctive taste to it. Uh, the beer, um, I can't speak much about um, that. Uh, I haven't made any beer with it yet. Um, Rich Bowman has. He sent me a bottle, 
and I have been protecting it. So I haven't drunk it yet. <laughs> and I know you're listening, Rich, and I'm sorry, but it's in my fridge and we've been waiting for an occasion and <laughs> haven't opened it. So I still have it. Um, but he's been, uh, uh, they've been playing with it and, and, and uh, Rich has made several batches and claims that it's a it's a delicious it's a delicious beer uh with a distinctive nose it's it's on his twitter feed so uh if you want to go and 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 follow rich bowman it's there um and the so the beers that we did um the uh, queensland museum does um I had a six month exhibition of ancient egyptian mummies which was a traveling exhibition from the queens um from the british museum and they do uh an after dark event once a month where the museum closes uh, and then it reopens at uh, in the evenings and it's uh, 18 and up, 18 being the drinking age and there's access to the exhibition and there's speakers and there's music and there's performers. And uh, I'd been to several of these events in previous years and thought it was a, a fantastic thing. So when I heard that there was the Egyptian museum or the Egyptian collection coming, I had approached the museum and had asked if we could uh, collaborate and do some beer for the the purpose of selling the beer at the at these events in the evenings and they agreed so I went to Bacchus Brewing here in in Brisbane in Capelaba and he's uh, uh, Ross Kendrick is the is the owner and he is known for doing small batches and uh, has a, a real eclectic mix of uh, recipes and so I'd approached him if he would be interested in doing it and he agreed and so we basically got out his recipe book and we picked three beers that that were close to what the Egyptians would have had and I just kind of fiddled with the ingredients slightly and took some things out that wouldn't have been uh, appropriate or wouldn't have been available to the ancient Egyptians and we basically just modified it but you know, truth be told, it was modern yeast. It uh, was, uh, you know, wheat, wheat and barley. Uh, no, no, we didn't put barley in. It was just wheat. And, um, and then just, it was all modern ingredients. So it was Egyptian inspired. It was just the ingredients. We, we were after making a very palatable beer. We wanted a beer that people would enjoy uh, as close to Egyptian ingredients as possible. We had considered doing it wild ferment but uh, the location of the brewery is in an industrial estate. So we thought better of opening the vats uh, and, just letting it, <laughs> and just letting it wild ferment. But also wild fermenting can be a little unpredictable. Uh, and we just decided not to go down that route this time. Mm -hmm. um, there's many more experiments to be done in that, in that vein. And they were delicious. We, the most popular was a pomegranate sour. Mm. We called it Sekhmet's Rage, uh, based off of the goddess Sekhmet. And um, yeah, that was, that was, that was both mostly pomegranate and hibiscus to add the bitterness, but also the, the kind of blood red color. Uh, and that was by far the, the crowd pleaser. We very rarely came home with anything left in that one. <laughs> That's a good yeah. sign, definitely. What were yeah. some of those things that you had to sort of flag and say, oh, let's not use this, that were major differences between um, a, an ancient Egyptian brew and a current brew when you were sort yeah. of recipes? So one of them was ginger. I think we took ginger out, uh, rose and uh, oranges. So I think he had used, uh, Ross had used, um, ro uh, orange peel in one of his recipes and then rose water for another one. And those are the ones that I had edited out. Oh, and I think cinnamon. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think cinnamon came up and I had to do a bit of homework on cinnamon and, and found that it, it came, it either came to Egypt later or it was uh, not, not, um, not native, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then the, the most distinctive thing is hops. So these beers would not have been hop, hopped uh, the way that we know beers to be. But unfortunately, the, the, the liquor laws in Australia uh, is that in order for a beverage to be called a beer, it must have hops. So we put uh, hops into our brews, but the legal minimum. <laughs> and we, we chose a hop that was a very, uh, not a very fruity, florally, big hop. Uh, mm -hmm. We just had to do it to meet the, the legal requirement. So unfortunately, our, our beers were hopped, but minimally. Nice. That's awesome. Well, I can tell you from personal experience that a, a, lar a sizable proportion of 
of microbiologists, researchers are either current or aspiring brewers of some capacity yeah. or current or aspiring bakers of some capacity. So I know, yeah. I know that there was a lot of interest in, in everything that you talked about today. Um, thank you so much for being willing to be here and share your work on this thank project you. with us. Thanks for inviting and, me. Absolutely. And thank you also, Andrew, so much and the rest of the MSI leadership team who is behind this, who has been behind the scenes today. Um, we'll hope to see a lot of the audience members again back here for our next seminar in August. You can keep up with this seminar series and all of the, our events via our website, which is msi.harvard.edu and also on our Twitter feed, which is at Harvard MSI. And with that, I'll sign off. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you.